October the 2nd. And that's the date. What day is it? <laughs> that was the week that was. It's Friday. Are we live, Keith? We are. We are live October the 2nd. We're giving you some respite from the hysteria around Trump. Some real news this week on that was the week that was. Uh, and uh, you lead, Keith, with your top of the week. Chin America, this weird relationship, this symbiotic love-hate relationship between America and China, not so much on a cultural level, but in economic and tech terms. So what's your analysis of this deeply problematic and yet essential relationship between China and America? Well, so the reason I lead with it is because um, CNBC did this amazing article last week. Uh, it was... Um, five charts that show how much the U.S. and the Chinese economies depend on each other. So this was not coming from any, any kind of biased source. It was coming from CNBC. Um, and if you, look at, if you look at what they show, let me, uh, let me just change the screen and, and let's go full, full graphics here. Um, starting with this chart, this is gross domestic product of the world. Um, in 2018 and 2019. Uh, and it's measured in something called producer pricing parity, which means it's roughly comparing apples to apples. China, when measured this way, is by far and away the largest economy in the world now. And <clears throat> its um, distance from the US is, is accelerating. Um, if you measure it in just absolute dollars, the US is still first. Um, let me take off that lower third caption. You'll be able to see it better. Uh, U.S. is still first. It's got the biggest absolute amount of dollars in GDP, and China is second. But um, when you zoom out to the trend, the orange line here is China as a percentage of world GDP, and the blue line is America, just measured in absolute dollars. So clearly, at, at some point quite soon, China is even going to be bigger than America measured in absolute dollars. Well, what CNBC do is then they, they show these two graphs. The first is that, and this is the first half of 2020, China's trade surplus with America was $142 billion. Um, and America's service surplus with China was only $11 billion. So America only compensates for 10% of its loss to China through services. So you can see the, re the rate of change is, um, is absolutely massive. Um, uh, let me just uh, well, put you back uh, on. For our audience, Keith, uh, for venture capitalists, for tech investors and entrepreneurs, what does this all mean? It means that the anti-China... TikTok stands is completely the opposite of America's strategic self-interest. What America should be doing, going back to the Nixon era, America should be embracing the economy, which is going to be the largest in the world soon, for the purposes of A, slowing it down, and B, selling to it. Um, uh, and if it doesn't do that, it can only be the victim of this process instead of managing it. It reminds me of when the UK embraced the US, not out of love, actually, but out of a desire to control change. And if you if you disengage from change, you don't control it anymore. I get this, but this is something that comes up every week almost. And, and, and this is an area I think we disagree on. You're you're very idealistic about this globalist future. You're almost dogmatic in your refusal to accept the reality of the world. And that reality is nationalism, whether you like it or not, whether or not it's in America's interest. I mean, we know where Trump stands on this, but even Biden now is sort of ambivalent about free trade. So this idea of suddenly American politicians embracing China and Chinese industry and Chinese trade is simply not going to happen. I, actually, we're more aligned than you realize. Um, I, I agree with you that the dominant trend in the world is nationalism. And I agree with you that the dominant instinct is to fight and not to cooperate. 
Um, so when I talk about uh, uh, globalism, it's a preferred future, not a likely future. And so, so let's talk about the likely future. What's realistic in this geostrategic, geopolitical atmosphere of nationalisms, maybe even xenophobia? It's interesting. I've been watching this Netflix show called Babylon Berlin. I don't know if you've seen it. I've heard of it. Yeah, I wanted to watch it. There's about 100 series. It seems a bit long for me. Well, it's it's set in 1929. Mm. And um, 1929 was right in the middle of that period where... Uh, global businesses started to be compelled to become national. Uh, you can think of Mercedes in Germany or right. any, any of the German companies that became subject to the Nazis. Um, so uh, whenever the world globalization accelerates, and it has done that at least four times in the last 120 years or so, um, as nation states uh, start to compete more and more aggressively, companies are forced to be less and less global and choose a side. Now, to me, that's a terrible fact. Uh, the human race uh, benefits from globalization and, and gets punished uh, by the shrinking back from it, usually through violence and war, by the way. I mean, really punished. So I'm, I'm, a, I'm a very big believer in globalism uh, at the level of economics but I do agree with you that politics holds it back and is likely to kill it. Very briefly then, Keith, where are we this week on TikTok? What's the situation? Uh, TikTok is so far winning in the courts. Trump is losing in the courts. And everything is on hold until that's resolved. Um, so uh, my bet several weeks ago, if anybody wants to go back and look, was that nothing's going to change, that TikTok will survive this because the American government doesn't actually have the authority or the power to do what it's trying to do. And, and the most important thing it can't do is get teens and millennials to uninstall it. Uh, and therefore, it's going to continue. So you can't fight the market. What's been happening on the market, and particularly the public markets this week? I know there are two big IPOs, Palantir and Asana, neither of which were... Uh, uh, Unconventional. They were pretty straightforward, weren't they? Uh, yeah. The well, um, yes and no. So um, let's uh, let's just put this full screen for a second. What happened is that um, they did what's called a direct listing. Now, with the direct listing, um, you will go public without raising capital from anybody immediately prior to going public. So there's no group of buyers who get an early purchase in order to then benefit from an increased share price. And the, the theory goes that because it's a direct listing, it just trades. And everyone who's got shares, venture capitalists mainly and founders and, and employees, can sell them right away if they want to, that a fairer price will be found. And, and that is more or less what happened. Palantir went public at $9 a share. When it opened for trading, it went up to about somewhere between ten and eleven dollars a share. It settled back down around nine dollars and thirteen cents last time I looked. And with Asana, it was in the twenties, and it's roughly stayed where it was, give a you know plus or minus a little bit. So it's a much smoother, less volatile process. And both are now public companies, and both of their investors can now buy and uh, buy and sell shares. And what does this tell us about? The future of SPACs. Uh, SPACs and direct listings belong in the same part of your brain. Uh, on the other side is IPOs. Mm. Um, so it's another win for the anti-IPO lobby, uh, in a sense. And uh, by the way, there are now many, many SPACs lined up, over 100. Uh, you can go and buy... Uh, Chamath Palapitiya's uh, IPOB, that's the ticker symbol, IPOB, and IPOC, those are SPACs waiting to merge with companies. And you can buy IPOA for around $12 a share. Oh, I think, no, it's 18 now. And you can buy IPOB for around $12 a share. And what that means is you're part of the SPAC prior to it merging with a company. Um, and, and, um, you know, that, that's a very interesting thing because normal people like you and me can become shareholders in a SPAC. What about a quick, quick, 
quick quick comment, Keith, on Palantir. It was, of course, one of Peter Thiel's big dreams. Uh, it's a company that hasn't had much press. It's still a rather mysterious company. What's your take on it? Um, you know, it's it's a contrarian company looked at from a Silicon Valley point of view because it expressly chooses to do business with the defense industry and specifically the government and the military. So, um, uh, you know, I personally don't think that that is that controversial. Um, you live in a capitalist society. It's made up of nation states. Nation states have militaries. Why wouldn't a company do business with it? So I'm fine with it. That said, my wife won't let me buy Palantir stock, but she will let me buy Asana stock because she, you know, ethically objects to it. And, you know, between ourselves, I'm no fan of American imperialism. So ethically, I should be against it too. But if I'm going to invest in Amazon or Microsoft or Google, there isn't that much difference to me between those companies and Palantir. So I'm assuming, Keith, that politics is still allowed to be discussed at your dinner table between you and your wife, Janae. Uh, it's lucky you don't work at, uh, at Coinbase. Good segue, Andrew. <laughs> Indeed. Uh, yeah, this week was, um, was very interesting in, in the world of Coinbase. Uh, we, can put, we can put that up so uh, people haven't followed news. Company of the week, although I, I perhaps would argue it's the uh, anti-company of the week, but that's a matter of opinion. Well, I made it startup of the week, uh, as you right startup of the week, up. which it isn't really a startup anyway. Is it, it? It, 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 well, it's still a private company. It's a big private company. Yeah. Um, uh, it, 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 um, Brian Brian Armstrong, the CEO, basically banned his employees um, <laughs> from being uh, activists and doing political discussion at work and offered those who disagree with him severance packages to leave the company. Um, now, I suspect this is a very personal decision. Uh, there are rumors that at previous All Hands meetings, Black Lives Matter supporters were pressuring him to uh, go on the record about Black Lives Matter, which, um, which he didn't. And uh, in his frustration at the continued requests, has decided to ban political activism. I don't know if that's so true. So ban political activism or ban any political discussion? I mean, you're still allowed to talk about Trump at work? According to this, no. I mean, the strict interpretation is you're here to work, not to bring your personal life to work. And just as you wouldn't, uh, you know... Um, just as you wouldn't do something personal in the middle of the office, you shouldn't. I almost gave an example then and thought better of it. So, two, you shouldn't bring your. No, politics. say it, say it. Come on, can't tantalize uh, the audience. No, I'm. I'm definitely not gonna. There's no. There's no censorship on that. Was the week there was? You can offend me. You can offend anyone you want. Well, just as you wouldn't kiss your wife in the <laughs> middle of the office to give the polite version of what I was thinking, neither would you. Should you bring your politics, just do your work and earn your money. That's basically what he's saying. Now, that is completely counter to the whole trend in the Valley. Uh, by the way, it's also, it, it, it's kind of, um, it's like an extreme version of cancel culture. Yeah. So, you, know, you know, shut up, keep quiet and just get your work done. Um, and obviously there was a backlash. There is a backlash. I find it interesting for lots of reasons, Firstly, I'm guessing we've become so intensely political now that the fear in Coinbase was it was detracting from people's work. Well, that but that is a bit weird, right? Because Coinbase is very political. Well, Coinbase, everything's political. I mean, isn't isn't that the reality? Even not being political is political in 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 2020 yeah. America. Yeah, but Coinbase is explicitly so. It's challenging the world financial system, right. it's challenging, it's... The, challenging the dollar. And, and so the right. So the decision has once again created two passionate camps in Silicon Valley. One of which uh, incorporates uh, PG. We can call him. We don't even need to na name him anymore for. For our regular viewers, Keith is obsessed with PG and he always manages to squeeze him into the show somehow. Easy to remember as well due to the English tea brand, PG Tips. 
<laughs> right. So, um, what, 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 how did PG Paul Graham respond to this? He came out uh, on the side of uh, the CEO Brian Armstrong, which is bizarre because Paul Graham has been leading the opposition to cancel culture uh, on Twitter, at least. But that shows that all principles are really out the window. Paul just doesn't like talking about these political issues. So for him, it's a good thing. Well, I, I think it's also that he has a close relationship to Coinbase. So if I, if I put um, if I put this back on and just scroll up a bit, the story before it is that Coinbase and Y Combinator both invested in a new startup mm. that's challenging the banking system, uh, Multis. So, um, you know, they're, they're, they're clearly allies and friends. And so it could be that Paul Graham just being loyal to a friend, but in doing so, yeah. he's contradicting his previous stance. Now, by contrast, Jack Dorsey and the previous CEO of Twitter, Dick Costello, both came out against Brian Armstrong, uh, arguing that politics is, you know, not disconnected from business and the twain should meet, not be separated. So it, it's um, we may be we may be brewing this up into a bigger brouhaha. I think it's world. very interesting. I think it's one of the big issues actually will face other corporations. So it's one of these things that happen first in Silicon Valley. I guess Jack can get away with it since Twitter's eliminated their office. So you're still allowed to talk about it at home. What happens if you're sitting in your living room? Can you be on Zoom and talk about politics? Uh, on Zoom, probably. Uh, well. In Twitter's case, yes, because Jack's in favor of it. But in Coinbase's case, no. And politics, of course, is, for better or worse, unavoidable. There have been some developments. Briefly, Keith, on the uh, on the issue of antitrust, the monopolies, which is an issue which, in my view, is the most important one in the short to medium term future of, of big tech. Yeah, so there's a lot this week, actually. Um, Firstly, Facebook announced that the Messenger chat service and Instagram are now merged, as in it's it's exactly the same code base. And if you're on Messenger, you can instant message and direct message somebody on Instagram. Surprise, surprise, right? Um, yeah, and a lot, and and in rapidly, the New York Times published an article saying this is how Facebook entrenches itself and makes it hard to break up from an antitrust point of view. Uh, I I added um, a video actually six-year-old video from Peter Thiel, mm. uh, which is a class he gave at Stanford titled Competition is for Losers, where he explains why wanting to become a monopoly, uh, as wanting to become a monopoly is exactly the right thing for a founder to want to do. Well, yeah, it's, but he said that, and it's kind of controversial, but it's obvious because you, when you start a company, you want to dominate the market. That's given. I don't see that as being in any way controversial. It's the job of the state, though, to restrict them. It's the job of the state to restrict their abuse of their success. Right. I agree. I, I um, meant it in those terms. Um, yes. And, uh, and so um, the key burden of proof in a democracy is, uh, is there abuse going on? Some of the things that Facebook is asked to do uh, don't really constitute abuse. I, I watched the, um, the social, what's that? Netflix movie, movie social. Um, it's it's the polemic against Facebook by ex Facebook employees. Social something. I don't know. Uh, I'll find it in a minute. Um, and it and it's interesting. Uh, the accusers were accusing Facebook of being responsible for QAnon and other mm. fake fake conspiracy theories. But the way I watched this documentary, it itself was a conspiracy theory. Yeah, but that's but that's another subject, Keith. That's going to do with antitrust. I mean, Facebook can can promote QAnon without being a monopoly, or you know, whether or th those are two different issues. Two different things. Uh, briefly, uh, I don't know if you have any links to it on this, but um, there's been some controversy because Biden has appointed. Uh, a senior ex-Facebook person to his team. And also um, there was a report that more and more money is coming from Silicon Valley to Biden. In the event, touch wood, please, God of a Biden presidency, do you expect the antitrust lobby or the antitrust 
momentum in DC to slow down or increase? Definitely increase. Um, I, I, I think the Silicon Valley versus democracy versus uh, antitrust debate will be stepped up several notches. Um, and I actually expect Silicon Valley to win um, because I think the substance of the accusations is way for thin. But I think it will be very politicized for the first couple of years. I actually think Biden might be smart and not make it one of his main agendas. I think it's going to be one of those off to the left agendas that don't. Well, certainly Obama will be, uh, there'll be, you know, the Eric Schmitz of the world will be putting pressure on their old friend Barack Obama to to tone down the antitrust stuff. And for, uh, so this will be a subject that will come up a lot, I think, in the future. And it's something we should focus on, I think, in, in, in later shows, particularly after the election. Finally, Keith, you, you managed to get PG into two things this week. Not only the startup of the week, but tweet of the week. You've got Sam Altman. Uh, what is Sam tweeting about this week? So, um, actually, this touched my heart, Andrew. It touched. You my have heart. a heart, Keith. It touched my heart. Um, Sam Altman tweeted: "A lot of people want to re replicate Y Combinator in some other industry or some other place." And uh, he then wrote a piece with, in which he says. Um, in general, people assume that it can be replicated. However, the entire secret to YC getting going was PG and Jessica, who is his partner. There was no other magic trick. And so he's giving credit where I believe credit is due uh, to the role of the individual in history, uh, Andrew. Uh, which is, uh, and yeah. once again, it's, it's, it's the old... Uh, it's the old cliche, you don't invest in tech or ideas, you invest in people. Yeah, it's um, to be a little bit controversial here. It's, um, it's Vladimir Ilyich Lenin. People make history, but not in conditions of their own choosing. Um, and, and Paul Graham and Jessica did make history. They, they had an idea, they embarked on it. They were persistent from small beginnings and built it into the monolith it is today in Silicon Valley with more than 250 companies uh, every batch going through their program. I'm a critic of the program, but I'm a, I'm a massive um, admirer of what they achieved through building it. And are you also a massive admirer of Sam Altman? I don't know Sam. Uh, he seems like a nice enough guy between you and me. I, I will uh, just let me admit, I thought I probably didn't like him. And I thought I didn't like Peter Thiel. But when I watched the video this week of Peter Thiel, he was introduced by Sam Altman. Yeah. It blew me away how good it was. And I, I, I clearly was mistaken in my Well, there's no, I mean, whatever you think of, of uh, Thiel, he's clearly very smart. Um, yeah, but no, I, and there's no doubt about that. I thought that. he was smart, but not likable, probably due to his Trump affiliations. But he's, he was amazing. And uh, I couldn't help but like him when I listened to it. Well, I'm not sure I can do this show anymore, Keith. If you like, <laughs> uh, if if you like uh, Peter Thiel, and uh, next week you'll be telling me that you uh, you like uh, Donald Trump. That was the week that was for October. There were uh, we're on Friday, October the second. October the ninth will be an equally important week, and I look forward to talking to you then, Keith. Thank you.